Hi guys, today you're joining me with a bit of a project um, that I'm recording on my phone, so I apologize that I don't have the most stable of hands, and if this gets very shaky, sorry. But anyway, what do I have in front of me? I have a Sophos. Most people are like, what the fuck is that thing? Well, these are email appliance servers, aka oh, mail servers, and that's all they were ever designed to do, except what many people don't realize about these is this is just a standard super micro micro server. Super micro micro server, that's a bit redundant. Anyway, so let's just pop the lid off and see where it is, I guess. What it is inside, even. There. Words. So, popping off the lid. And this is what I mean by it's pretty much a default super micro server that's rebadged. Because inside is a super micro... Um, PDSMI Plus motherboard. This is um, LGA775, oddly. Um, but for this sort of uh, application, perfectly fine. Greeted, uh, paired with an Albacom, aka the power supply maker of Supermicro, and it's only a 260 watt device, surprisingly. So, Specs of these servers default out of the factory is Celeron D processor, uh, clocked at 2.93 megahertz, uh, gigahertz. Well, if it was 2.93 megahertz, it would be hella slow. But yeah, 2.93 gigahertz with 256 mega cache with a 533 fans bus, I believe. Default, these come with 512 megs of DDR2 ECC RAM, uh, but in my own experimenting and playing, uh, I actually changed this out to two, two gigabyte DIMMs that are non-ECC, and it works perfectly fine. And autofocus, please. <laughs> and yeah, that's all you can really say about this. Uh, in terms of I.O., PS2, mouse and keyboard, I should really turn this around, uh, two USBs, serial, uh, RS-232, uh, VGA, and two gigabit LAN ports, and that's about it. Oh, and a 160 gig, surprisingly, Seagate drive that still works. <laughs> yeah, I'm as shocked as you. <laughs> now, you must already thinking, why is he recording this video about a fucking super micro server? Well, my parents' house ooh, um, is pretty shit. No, it's not shit. The internet is shit. Uh, they use BT as a provider and it's simply an ADSL line. And over the years, it's just got slower and slower. And there's now a demand for more wireless. It's kind of bodged at the minute using a BT Home Hub 3 and an old Linksys WAG120N. Yeah, um, and there's been various issues in regards to DNS, uh, the uh, hub just stopping it, stopping doing it, DHCP, where it would just take a long time to join the network. Um, that was kind of replaced by this Raspberry Pi. Uh, print, print originally was doing an AirPrint server for the, all the iOS devices in this house. Cough, not, not that one though. Um, <laughs> And then it sort of took up the DHCP role. <laughs> and yeah, I just got basically sick of this and decided, you know what, I'm just gonna build a big, proper badass router. So just to clarify, I watching that bit of the video back and uh, realized I totally forgot why I wanted to do this. The idea behind putting a proper PFSense router in, yeah, that's the software I was gonna use is so that I could have greater control and remote access and try and troubleshoot issues without, you know, going, go on this device, type in this address. And I wanted to try and, you know, uh, do it remotely. As well as I wanted to put some VPN services at the firewall so I could enable a remote offsite backup for my primary location. Only a small, something like 250 gig worth of disk space for the really important files that I don't want to lose in case of, you know, God forbid uh, my servers are stolen or fire. You know, I just want an offsite backup that's nowhere near where my primary servers are. And I found this on eBay 
God, it went for, I think it was £25, including shipping. Yeah, so considering I added RAM that I already had, it's cost me 25 quid. The only problem with this machine is it's a 1U server. And for, for me, I, I've owned a lot of 1U servers over the years, um, and it doesn't bother me in the slightest, they're noise. However, this one is particularly loud if it ever decides that I've plugged in power. Yeah. So yeah, as you can tell, it's pretty loud. For me, this wouldn't really bother me. You know, I've got other machines making noise. I hope you can still hear me. Uh, but in a house that is very quiet and there's no real place to tuck these machines away, yeah, I'm gonna have to do something about that. So my plan is to transplant this machine into a slightly larger desktop, replace the uh, cooler and see where we end up, I guess. So I guess step one is to remove the heat sink. Don't really, it's just a huge weight and uh, I'd rather take it off before I try and take the board out. So here is that lovely Celeron D processor, 341 model by the looks of things. As I said, 2.93 gigahertz, 256 megs of cache. Um, so yeah. God, this thing hates autofocusing. <laughs> So here's the original heatsink, and my god, this thing weighs quite a bit. Um, solid copper, um, just base on it, really tightly packed fins. And before you question it, no, I haven't actually cleaned this. This is how it came out of the machine, and for a machine that's obviously seen quite a bit of use, it was super clean on the inside. Tops to, well, props to whoever, uh, owned this machine previously. Um, oh yeah, this is the heatsink I'll be replacing it with. I got this out of uh, like a scrap machine I found um, that also used 775, uh, except the fan was done on it, so I'm going to be using this one from an AMD cooler. However, I've noticed something. This fan's quite thick and it won't fit. Oh, that's no good. But I don't want to stop this build, so I'm just going to bodge my tip for now and hopefully it'll be fine. Or I might try and find a stock 775 heatsink that I think I have somewhere around here. So, yep, yeah, the motherboard is now out of the chassis, uh, except I now need to remove this. When I first looked at this, I was like, oh my god, no, it's a freaking backplate and it's supposed to be bound to the board. Thankfully, not. Just a bit of sticky tape on the plastic that it's got in there, and it comes off. I'll take that off in a second. <laughs> so, thankfully, no issues with being able to mount a different cooler on the board, which is nice. It also means that I'll be able to take this 775 cooler and possibly put a different, um, put a different board in here in the future if this board doesn't make it back into here. Boop. One thing I have just noticed about this server um, is that the hard drive is actually screwing through the bottom of the chassis. That's how small this thing is and how much they didn't want to put extra material in. But there's a screw missing for the hard drive mounts. Oh no. Oh well, not an issue, it's coming out anyway. So yeah, I'm gonna take a better look at this hard drive now it's out. Seagate Barracuda, 7200 RPM. Eh, okay. 160 gig. When was this thing made? Um, interestingly, it has it covered up? I think, or I'm being blind. Mm, no, it, oh wait, date code, 08302. Ah. Why couldn't you just tell me the date rather than hiding it in mysterious numbers? <laughs> Now, I've got you staring at the floor because this is the dramatic reveal for the case that this is all going in. It is a top of the line, I have no clue what the hell it is. Now, <laughs> you must probably look at this going, 
Holy shit, he has found the beigeiest of beige, beige, case, beige, beige, case, beige out there. In case you didn't guess, it's beige. Um, <laughs> this case has a quite a bit of history. Um, I didn't originally actually own this. My godfather uh, originally owned it. And I have it now because he's upgraded, upgraded many times since then. Uh, except this build actually had several uh, computers in. But this is the machine, or the case, that the machine I first ever worked on was in. And hence, I still have it. Um, if you have any idea what this case is, message me. Because I'd really like to know. Because there is no manufacturer's marks on it. But the original build badge, which was an AMT Duron. <laughs> yeah. Impressive. One of the main reasons I actually still love this case as well is undoing this lovely thumb screw. Yeah, that, that's a thumb screw apparently. Um, <laughs> is the fact that the whole motherboard tray, as long as it doesn't get caught on the side panel, as can be seen, but if I just pop that, the motherboard tray is in fact removable, which is brilliant. <laughs> Um, and it's actually a feature that I'd love on many, 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 many cases that are out there. But unfortunately isn't. Oh well. In the words of many Staples employees, that was easy. Yeah, I know, it's a bit of a bodge. No I.O. shield, no shielding protection for that. And a swap for an 80mm fan, but at the end of the day, Gotta work with what I work with. Got that. Let me try that again. Gotta work with what you have. And in this case, a very old case. <laughs> but um, that's a terrible joke. Oh well. Let's get on to mounting this thing and trying to figure out how to put a fan on it, I guess. And that is how you bodge something. <laughs> Twist ties from packaging coming really really handy for anything um hence why i keep a lot of them should really make sure that that is not poking any pcbs uh otherwise we might end up with a bad time oh well <laughs> it'll work i hope time to get the motherboard back in this should be nice and easy Ooh. Ooh. tease it why aren't you moving? Tease it. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm surprised I haven't broken anything yet. Hey, there we go. See, that's why I love these systems. <sighs> Simple. So, plugging in the front uh, headers when I get joined by this guy. Hi. You have no idea what I'm doing. Well, better suppose I, uh, there. Suppose better check if this thing turns on, so power on on the back. Nice green LED on the board. Here we go. Well, it's definitely quieter than the other system. Uh, power LED is working. People on the board is working. Need to check that hard drive LED because I'm pretty sure I plugged it in the wrong way. Focus. Yeah, it's not Core 2 Duo. Lying. Hmm. Yeah. Cat's agreeing with me. Hmm. This machine does take quite a while to get past post, but I'm not sure it's that long. I advise you turn off your systems before you do this. Do as I say rather than do as I do. And all that. Plug. Ah, there we go. It was the wrong way around. So I better flip the rest of these now, I suppose, at the same time. So it's definitely much quieter with the side panels on than uh, the old one new unit. Still, uh, still a bit loud. But it'll be fine. Not like ear splitting loud anyway, like the other machine. The other machine? Other fan. So yeah, everything was going smoothly. Um, however, 
PFSense seems to have locked me out of the sorry, it's my finger. Um, seems to lock me out of the web configuration, complaining about the oh, flipping it, put my finger on lines. FPM, PIM, something or other, which is basically just giving me a 503 service error whenever I try to connect to the box via the Ethernet. So, just waiting for a live CD to start now, so I can set up the wine connection and hopefully have this done soon. So everything's working pretty well um, now. Got the PFSense box logging into PPOE, PPPOE, perfectly fine. Dogs running around. Um, interesting note is that when you're doing this, it doesn't list any DNS servers. Um, by default, like by here, you'll get some listings of you know, just the DNS servers using, usually by default, it gives you 127.0.01, which is one that fires back to loop back of the firewall. Um, then any that might be set over the WAN. Um, in this case, usually ISP provided ones, but nope, nothing. I thought that was pretty interesting. But anyway, everything's running pretty damn stable now. Um, just need to get my OpenVPN set up so I can connect back in. Yay! Also set up a curl script to uh, email me the IP because the problem with ADSL is it's not static on the WAN. Woo! And it can change. Oh well. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that guys. Uh, check back soon. I Got some other things in the pipeline and uh, yeah, fun fun.